start recording. Excellent. Yes, that is being recorded now. So I have I can't swear anymore. <laughs> or I can, but no, but I shouldn't. All right. So uh, we won't be using the normal PDF like we did with the binomials and the Poisson because um, we're not going to be looking at we're going to be looking at a continuous curve, and so because of that, is, which is going to look like a bell. Um, all right, where this is the mean, median, and mode, the, because it is a symmetric curve. Every the mean, median, and mode are the same, and the only difference between every um, between the normal curves are those things. So the mean, median, mode can be different values. So this one can be 100, obviously, and this one can be 100. But the difference between them is, in this case, is the standard deviation. And so in this one, the standard deviation looks like it might be um, oh, 40. And in this one, the standard deviation is 10. So the spread changes them. And so therefore, they become wider or skinnier, depending upon the standard deviation, if the means are the same. Um, the other thing that then occurs is with the um, empirical rule, which we talked about in chapter one. I think it's my microphone. I think I need to get a new microphone, because um, I think the cord has a, a snag in it. Um, so remember, there was the 68. 95, 99.7 rule, or the empirical rule, which said that one standard deviation is about 68% of the data, two standard deviations is about 95% of the data, and 3% is about 99.7. All right, and so because of that, these values here tend to be important with this. So the 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 standard deviations, the the percent of data is going to be the same, but it's going to be the ranges that, that are different. Now get, get out of the sink. Our cat is sitting in the sink. It's very strange. I don't know why he does that. He's staring longingly at the, uh, no, he's going to go lick the, the faucet, because um, the, the water driplet, he likes to drink from the faucet. I could turn my computer. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll turn my computer around so you can all see the cat sitting in the sink. <laughs> Looking at the faucet, because you know I think that's important. <laughs> it's very distracting. Um, so we have these. So these rules here. I want to just erase that. Yeah, we we actually have we we bought a um, a water bowl that has a faucet built into it that we plug in and the water like runs through, and so he usually drinks from that, but it's off at the moment. So um, now he's sitting in the in the sink waiting to drink from the faucet. <laughs> Cats are weird. All right. Um, so this. Knows what he wants. Yes, yes, he does. Sometimes he'll go to the, in the in, and sit in the bathtub and, and drink from that too, because again, cats are weird. Uh, the test is on chapters two and three. Uh, okay. Uh, so the next test will be on chapters four, six, and seven. So coming up eventually. Um, so we are spread here. Our standard deviation tells us how wide this curve is going to be compared to other curves with the same uh, mean. Um, and then the other thing that can happen is we can have a mean that's over here. We could have the same distribution or you know, a skinny or fatter one, and then it would also change how the curve looks. But this, these percentages are always going to be pretty close. It's not perfect. Because 95% of the data is, it's not exactly 95% of the data that's two standard deviations. It's um, uh, two standard, 95% is 1.96 standard deviations, but for quick calculations, two is close enough. Um, it makes life really easy and, and nice. Um, 
but so it's not perfect, but it gives you a good enough feel for it. And the formula is going to be the same one we talked about in chapters one and two, where Z is equal to X minus the mean over the standard deviation. Now get, go over there. All right. So we use, this is going to change next week, um, but just because of we're using means, but the, the, the ideas stay the same. It's just a little more, this is a mean of one thing, and this is a standard deviation of one thing. So that's why it's the same values. Stay. All right. So, um, so though, so this is the, the 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 formula we're going to use that we would calculate the area under the curve, whether it's less than greater than or between. Okay, so we just we need to have these z values to then um, look up on a chart which we don't use anymore, but um, That one looks good. So we look up on the chart, and this shows us the area under the curve, which is equal to the probability because the area under the curve is 1. All right? And they go all the way from negative, like the charts go from negative 3.69 to positive 3.69 and give us you know, the area that is under the curve. Now, we don't use these anymore because, um, well, we don't have to. We have calculators that will do that for us. And that's what, um, so this is the last time you ever have to see the chart because what we used to have to do is we would have to do what's called interpolation. And you would get values, because most of the time you get values between these numbers. You get 2.13 uh, and you have to figure out, well, what's the area? That's really at 2.13. So between these two values, you'd have to do some math and find out the area that's between those. And it gives you an approximation and not, you know, so not the exact value. Um, but we had all these tables. So we don't have to use those anymore because we use our calculators. And what our calculator will do is it will go to the normal CDF. And it will ask us for a lower value. And this here is the value for negative infinity. Because it has to calculate between them. So to do to type this in, it's negative 1. And then to, to get to the E, there's a couple ways we could do it. But it's right here above the comma. So second comma, 99. And so... This is a negative one with 99 zeros behind it. And if I want to look at a curve, um, somebody give me a number for the mean. So to give me a number. 2.36. Anyway. Two point, thank you. Okay. Uh, 2.37. And so now somebody give me a standard deviation um, between 0 and 1. Point 0.53. Point 0.53. Okay, 
Now, uh, somebody give me a number between negative 4 and negative 1. What, what was it? Negative 2. Negative 2, okay. So I want to find the area that's less than between that from negative infinity up to negative 2. I want to find the area of this curve where this is the mean and this is the standard deviation. Okay. So to do that, I go to my calculator and I tell it I'm going to go up from negative infinity all the way to negative 2. And my mean is this 2.37. And my standard deviation is 0 0.53. And I'm going to paste. And those of you with the older calculator, you're going to have the same thing. You're going to go to normal CDF. And then you're going to type in negative 1 e to the 99th power, a comma. The number that we're interested in. How do you get that E again, Professor? Uh, second comma. That's how you get the E. Gives you the E. All right. So you're going to put your lower. Uh, so you have normal CDF, and then in parentheses you have your lower bound, which in our case, this problem here is negative infinity, comma, your upper bound, comma, your mean, comma, and your standard deviation. And then you can hit enter or close parentheses. So lower bound, upper bound, mean, standard deviation. And then it closes that. And when I hit enter, it gives me the area under the curve. So this answer is 0. So that wasn't very helpful. <laughs> um, let me change this to. Um, a one, and that'll give me a better number there. So I can bring it back. 1.53, and hit enter, and so I get 0 0.0021. So the probability of finding a number, the number uh, from negative infinity to two, negative two, when the mean is this and the standard deviation is this, is less than 1%. It's 0.21% of the curve. Okay. And so we can look at all of those things. We could look at the values above the curve. We could look at the values squished in the middle. And so we can find all of those pieces that we want. We're just, just going to put in whatever our lower bound is, whatever our upper bound is, the mean and standard deviation. So if I wanted to find the area from negative 1 to infinity, greater than negative 1. Again, I go to the vars. I come to number 2. My lower bound this time is going to be just negative 1. My upper bound is going to be positive infinity. So 1, comma, 99. My mean and standard deviation have changed. This is a 1.53. And then when I hit paste and hit enter, it tells me that 98.6% of the data is from above neg is negative one or above. And we no longer care about this and this, this 
and this because they are the same thing. Lo lo greater than and greater than or equal to are the same thing and less than and less than or equal to are the same thing. So we no longer care about at least and at most. They're all just less than and greater than because those number, those two thing, those two numbers are going to be using the same value every time because on a continuous curve, we can't possibly write the number that's just a little bit bigger than negative one. And we can't write the number that's just a little bit, bit less than negative two. We can only write negative two. So these two things are equivalent now. Oops, that was a really horrible circle. And these two things are equivalent, all right, when we're doing them. So they're not going to say at least or at most. They're just going to say they're going to say less than or um, greater than. I mean, they could say it, but it's not going to matter. Um, how do I get to normal CDF? All right. So on your calculator, second vars. So the second key and then the variable key will bring up the distributions and those are all right here. Okay. The other thing that they're going to ask us is between. Got it. Okay, good. And usually at this point I break out into song because, you know, that's just my life. Uh, and because I'm me, it's a Sesame Street song. It would be this one. Mr. Between, Mr. Between, and between me is God that I've ever seen. Sometimes I'm getting used between two pieces of bread, and sometimes I'm led between two guys named Dead. And drums and a girl with a fiddle. <sighs> Enough of that. <laughs> but, you know, that's because sometimes we have to have fun. But that's... <laughs> thank you. So, thank you, thank you. Yeah. And it's a two-drink minimum, so you know, uh, make sure you tip your waiter. I'll be here all weekend. Um, so if I want to find the area between these two things, I just my lower bound and my upper bound. I just put in the values that they've been given. So it's still going to be the normal CDF. My lower bound is going to be negative two. My upper bound is going to be negative one. My mean and standard deviation haven't changed. And I paste them. And so those of you with the older calculator, it's the same thing. You put in your lower bound, normal CDF, the lower bound, the upper bound. Everything is separated by commas, the mean and the standard deviation. And when I hit enter, it gives me the probability of finding the number, these numbers between these two things. So everything is based off of um, probability and finding the area under this curve, OK? Now, just because it's messy. The other thing that they could ask us is say, all right, we have a mean of um 80 
a standard deviation of seven. And they want to know um, the probabilities, like the area between two values, they might give you the standard deviation. Uh, but they might also say, what is the, uh, what number has, is the 40th percentile? So 40% of the area is below what number? Okay, and so to do that, we have to come to our calculator. And our calculator can only do below. So, oops. But it's the inverse norm. All right. And so we give it to get tell us the area. It says, okay, 40%, so 0.4. The mean is 80. The standard deviation is 7. And we paste. And then we hit enter, and it will tell us what number will give us that. So 78.23 would give us 40% 40 of, 40 of the data is below 78.23. If they wanted to know what number is 40% above the data, We wouldn't be able to find that on our calculators. The newest version can, but all the rest of them cannot. What we would have to do is we would have to find out, well, if that's 40%, then what is on this side? So if 40% is over here, how much is over here? Good, good, excellent. So 60% is on the other side. So we would then look up the area under the curve that's equal to 60%. So we'd bring this back. Change this to 0 0.6 and hit enter. And we would find that the number is 81.77. So 40% of the data is bigger than 81.77 because 60% of the data is less than 81.77. And they would tell you how many decimal places they want you to round to. And that's how you're going to get what it, decide where you're going to stop. But so those are the things that we're going to have to do in this chapter is really just find the between parts and find less than or greater than. And so you have to be able to know how to find the greater thans because we can't do that on our calculator. We can only find the less thans if they give us the area. If they give us the, um, if they're asking us what, um, what percent of the values are greater than 81, then we could find that on our calculator because we'd have the mean and standard deviation and we can do the upper and lower bounds. So they're either gonna give us the area and ask us to find the number, or they're gonna give us the number and try ask us to find the areas. And they could ask us to find the area between these two things. Well, that just means like, what is the, if they asked us, well, what is the middle 40%? Right, um, or here I guess the middle 20%, we could find, we'd have to find less than 40 and then less than 60 because that would be of us the middle, this is the middle 20%. And they, they will ask you, they, they, but they usually ask about quartiles. So, um, or the, what is, here's the interquart, what, what, what are the interquartile range? And so you have to remember that the quartile range is 25% and 75%, but they're going to ask you those kinds of questions. So would the, uh, would the in between, like if it's 0.4, like either on the right or the left, the in between would always be 20%? Yeah, because it, this has to add up to 100. Equal, right. right. Okay. No, no, because it has to add up to 100. So 40 plus 40 is 80. So what's left is 20%. So yeah, mm -hmm. the middle part has, would like I could ask you, you know, what, 
So what is the values here? I want to find the 30% here and the, the uh, 75th percent here. I could do that, but uh, usually they're just they're going to say, you know, what is the middle 60%? And then you have to figure out, well, okay, well, if this is the middle 60%, the same amount is going to be left on both sides. So that's 40%. So this is going to be 20 and this is going to be 20. Or by the time, you know, so they're going to ask you those. They're going to, they usually ask you what's the middle 50% or the interquartile range. So um, those are, that's a common question that they're going to ask you. Um, so the first question I think is the only time that they ask about the Z-score in this. And so um, a patient recovery is uh, has a mean of 5.5 days and a standard deviation of 1.8 days. Oh, no, that's not. So what is the median? It's not even asking you a, a question. Like, there's no math in this. Because you're like, well, I mean, you could solve that, I suppose. Um, but, you know, because knowing that the median is 50% of the data. But because they tell you that it's normally distributed, and every one of these questions is going to tell you that it's normally distributed, because otherwise it doesn't work. Um, so if they tell you it's normally distributed, the mean, median, and mode are the same. So because they're telling you it's, that it's normally distributed, the mean and the median are the same number. So you, there's no math you actually have to do. If you didn't know, you could come here and clear this out. Draw your graph. So this was um, 55. A 5.5. Standard deviation is 1.8. Median means 50%. So this whole thing here, probably should have just grabbed a bigger marker. So that's 50%. So I could come to my calculator and go, all right, smarty pants, second bars. Inverse normal, I know the area, it's 50%. So 5 point, oops, clear. Area is 50%, 0. 0.5. The mean is 5.5. The standard deviation is 1.8. I paste and I let it do the, oh, and they tell me it's 5.5. Because, yeah, oh, that's right. The mean and the median are the same value. So. Only in that case, only when you're talking about means and medians on a normal distributive curve. Um, here, it's a patient recovery time is normally distributed. Notice, okay, a mean of 6.8 days, so they've changed that. The standard deviation they've changed. What is the Z score for a patient that takes nine days to recover? So, again, to calculate Z score, Z equals X minus mu over sigma. And we have all of our values. We have uh, 6.8, 3.3, and 9. So 9 minus 6.8 divided by, I think it was 3.3. So remember, in your calculator, you need to put this in parentheses. Do that first, because otherwise you'll get the wrong answer. It will do the, this division. So parentheses, 9 minus 6.8, close parentheses, divided by 3.3. .3. And you get that as an answer. Or you could do 9 minus 6.8. Enter, divided by 3.3, .3, and you still get the same value. 
So you can do this, you can do it as two separate parts. It's like do this, make sure, just make sure you do this first and then do the division. Or if you use parentheses, you can type the whole thing in at the same time. But either way, you're gonna get the same answer. Um, and they only want two decimal places, so you do that. If you had typed in nine minus 6.8 divided by 3.3, .3, you're going to get this. And you're like, wow, okay. And you put that in and you get it wrong. You'd be like, why did I get this wrong? Well, because it did this division first and then subtracted it. So you did 6.8 divided by 3.3, .3, which is eh, two-ish, you know, and then subtracted it off a of nine and that's why you get this nine, 6.9. So don't do that. Um, Oh, so this problem here, uh, you don't know the answer to because you don't know what the exponential, anything about the exponential distribution. The exponential distribution, the mean and standard deviation are the same. So that's something you need to know uh, in order to be able to answer this question. Because, so it says here that it cannot follow the, the exponential distribution. Well, that can't be, that's true because it tells us that we have a mean of this and a standard deviation of this. And so because of that, they're not the same value. And so therefore it can't, this is true. We can't have the, the exponential distribution because the mean and standard deviation aren't the same. Um, other than that, um, the mean can be normal and it can be uniform because there's a formula for calculating the uniform distribution and there's a formula for counting, calculating the, um, well, actually, there's no formula for calculating the normal distribution, but the normal distribution can have any mean and any standard deviation. The standard deviation can be bigger than the mean. It can be smaller than the mean. The standard deviation can be um, uh, one. It can be, um, it could be zero. Every number is exactly the same. It, you know, we can have, we can't have negative standard deviations, um, but other than that, like the standard deviations will always be positive because um, you're squaring numbers and so you should never get a negative anyway. Um, so standard deviations will always be positive, but it can be anything from zero to infinity. Um, but it can't be exponential because the mean and standard deviation have to be the same in that distribution. But in these, like there's other things that like the normal, dist the uniform distribution is a formula for it. And, um, it's weird, I have no idea why um, it is what it is, but um, there's an, an actual distribution a formula for it. And so it could very well work that these are the same things if you did the math out correctly. Um, hey, uh, professor, real quick, um, I, I think I skipped the part in that uh, Z-score thing. How did you get uh -huh. the nine? Oh, I got this, how did I get the nine? Yeah, was it adding the whole days together, the six and the three? Oh, um, uh, probably because I typed it in wrong. Um, oh, uh, right here. Here's the nine. Oh, okay, gotcha. Thank you. Missed that part. <laughs> I'm like, where? I'm like, I know I saw. Where's that number? Uh, there it is, right there. That's so. This is the x value. So they're giving you some information here, and then they give you some more information in the next sentence. Okay, uh, number four says the length of time it takes to find a parking space at 9 a.m. Uh, is a normal distribution with a mean of seven, a standard deviation of three. Would it be unlikely for you to uh, find a spot in less than a minute? And um, the answers are yes or no, basically. And so to be able to do that, we can look at, um, where this falls. So we had less than a minute, we'll just say one. One minus seven over three. So one minus seven is negative six divided by three, which is negative two. So less than one could be any number between zero and one. So we're gonna have a standard deviation that's smaller than negative two. 
that, that's going to be more negative. And because of the empirical rule, where 95% of the data is between negative two standard deviations and positive two standard deviations, there's not a lot left out here. Well, it looks like a lot because I'm really bad at drawing. Um, there's very little space out in these areas. So finding a, a parking space that's uh, finding a number that's less than two standard deviations, more than two standard deviations away on either side is very unlikely because there's only five percent. So there's only two and a half percent chance of finding a number over here, and two and a half percent chance of finding a number over here. So um, it would be almost, it, it's almost impossible for this to happen. I mean, it's not impossible, but it, it's improbable. Okay, and so. Because it doesn't happen very often, it seemed to be as unlikely. And therefore, um, when we get to chapters uh, 9 and 10, excuse me, um, where we're doing hypothesis testing, anything that has, like, we're going to be talking about alpha, which is this area, this pink area. The, so if, if our probability of, of um, belief is here, anything that falls over in these pink areas is unlikely to happen. And therefore, if it does fall over here, then our, our hypothesis is probably false, probably not true. And so therefore, we, have to, we can say that it's statistically uh, reasonable to believe that our, our hypothesis was wrong. So if we're constantly finding spaces in less than a minute, then one of these two things is probably not right. Either the mean is in seven or the standard deviation is in three. Okay. And we are usually testing the mean, so we would say that the mean is probably not is probably not seven. It's you know, because we're always finding spaces, you know, faster. If we're finding spaces over here all the time, this is thirteen minutes, then again the standard deviation probably isn't seven, it's probably higher. Because the more like the more often it, we get values in these pink areas, the less likely this is true. So that's why they're saying it's unlikely that um, we would be that we'd be surprised if it took us less than a minute to find a parking space. It's kind of like being in Lowell on, during school days, All right? There's no parking spaces anywhere once you get to like uh, 10 o'clock. Ooh, sorry, excuse me. Um, my son has a had a has a track meet in New York City this afternoon, and so my wife had to, we had they had to leave at seven o'clock, which meant I had to be up for six. But that meant her alarm went off at five, so she could go work out. So I was and I woke up before that, which was four, because that's she always wakes up before the alarm. So I've been awake for five hours already, six hours already. <laughs> And I haven't, like, the day is not even started. It shouldn't even be started. It's not even 10 o'clock, and I've already been up for six hours. It's insane. So I'm sorry if I don't want me to be yawning. All right. So this here is, again, um, the author's way of denoting what the distribution is. So x follows, in this case, the normal distribution. And you don't have to put a capital N. It can just be a small n, where this is the, the value of the mean. And this is the value of the standard deviation. Okay, so that's whenever you see these parentheses in this. You know, so whenever they're asking what is the distribution, that's all they want. They just want you to be again, like the last week we had the binomial, where we had uh, that this was a binomial distribution, where we had. Um, the probability of success and the number of trials. This one, and then we had the Poisson where we had lambda. You know, now we have the normal distribution with the mean and the standard deviation. So it's just one more thing that you're going to have to to just remember to write in. 
but it's just it's just another way of writing what the distribution is. Because whenever you do these things, um, especially hypothesis test, you should know what distribution you're talking about because there's so many of them. So it just helps to have a written down somewhere that it's going to be, I'm going to be using this test because I'm using this distribution. And so it, it, it's a useful tool to have. It's just, you know, her way of writing it out. So again, you probably won't see it in any other book. <laughs> um, that's just the way it is. All right. So we have uh, balls hit into the outfield, have a mean of 220 feet and a distance, a standard deviation of 50 feet. And they want to know if they have one fly ball, they choose at random, so throughout the, the season, they want to know what's the probability that, that the ball traveled fewer than 198 feet. And so to do that, we go to our calculator. We turn it on. We go to distribution, which is second vars. Because they're telling us that this is normally distributed, we're going to go to the normal CDF. Okay, and they want fewer than 198 feet. So it kind of helps to graph it first. So we have a mean of 220. And we can look at these and say, okay, well, you know, I guess this is, let's see, it's a 20, 40, 60, 80, 300. Okay, so yeah, that could be the mean. That could be the mean. That could be the mean. And 20, that, that, so they all look like they have the right mean. So now we have to deal with the standard deviation. And the standard deviation is 50. So, um, oh, and then we have to deal with the graphing. Okay. So, again, we don't know what the graphs should look like. So, um, we can take any of them for example, but this here is looking at less than 198 feet. Okay, so the graph has to start at 198 and has to fill in up to 198. So it's neither one of these two already because we can tell that this is greater than and this is greater than. So we're looking for 198 feet or less. Well, this one graphs at like just about 220 and this one graphs at just about 200 so it has to be this one the rest of the stuff is is unimportant we don't care about these heights they're they're they're, they're meaningless the reason it's not this one is because they're graphing too far over okay um had this been over here then it would have been a perfectly fine graph but because they're graphing at about 220 or less just about 220 so or less. That's why it's not this one, and this one has to be the answer. So this is what our graph looks like. So we can tell that this goes from negative infinity up to 198. So from negative infinity up to 198 with a mean of 220 and a standard deviation of 50. Now, you'll notice that it always start, mine always starts with 0 and 1. So that would be if we were using the Z distribution. The Z distribution actually normalizes it down so that the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. And it does all that work, and that's where we get that Z score. So that Z score, if we put that in there and found that number, we wouldn't have to change the standard deviation and the mean. But why do extra math if you don't have to? So this will do all of it for you, so you can actually put in the values that we're interested in. And so we paste, and then we hit enter. And like I said, for those of you who have um, the older graphing calculators, lower bound, comma, upper bound, comma, mean, comma, standard deviation. And when you hit enter, you get 0.3399 and they want to have four decimal places so 32 so 32 point nine, uh, 32996 which means we round up well that's as 10 
that makes that a zero, that makes that a one. One plus nine is 10, that makes that a zero. We add one to this, three plus two is three. And one plus two is three. So that's where they get the point three, three, zero, zero. And then the next one they want to know, uh, what is the 80th percentile? Again, we're looking at the graphs. Well, that's the zero percentile and that's the 100 percentile. Uh, this here says it's going to be above 80, you know, above 80 percent. And 80th percentile means that numbers less than 80 percent. So this is 80 percent of the data is going to be, or be less than what value? So that's why it's this graph. And because we have percentiles, we have a inverse norm. I don't know it was a bump for a question. So let me just go back here, check on this. Uh, I get a negative. Uh, you probably have your, um, how did you get a negative? There we go. Um, you should never get a negative area when you're doing uh, normal CDF. Because you're always putting in, because um, it's always going to be a number between zero and one. So unless you hit the negative when you started the thing, like if I put, if I accidentally put, hit negative and then did it, I mean, that's how I could get a negative, or if I subtracted it from one, I could get a negative, but it's an area. Areas are always going to be positive. So that the reason I got a negative is because I have a negative value there. Um, but you, you should never get a negative when you are doing normal CDF because it's always going to give you area under curve, which has to be between zero and one. Um, if you're subtracting something if from something, you could get a negative. But to get the, again, to get the 80th percentile, we have to go to inverse norm. We're putting in our area of 0.8, our mean and standard deviation, which were uh, 220 and 50. And that's how they get this 262.1. Yes. Oh, okay. Nobody has a yeah, question. Yeah, I was listening to my class. Okay. Because <laughs> I couldn't connect out there, so. And then. Should I call as one? And here they just want you to write down the probability statement. Yeah, that's fine. So mm -hmm. they were they're asking you. I would not be taking it, but that's fine. The probability that x is less than k. Well, it's like. For seniors, you have to do a capstone project, or you can do a class at a college, or you can do an inter internship. What does that do to this one? It's math. Yeah. The worst possible thing. Okay, so um, we have to, so they're asking what's the probability that X is less than K? Well, that we don't know what K is at the moment, but K we just found out to be 262.1. So the probability that it's less than that is the 0.8. So the, that's, it's kind of a silly, again, a silliest question, um, but the probability that a value is less than 262 feet is 80%. 
So that's all it is. So the 80th percentile is the probability score answer that, you know, if we picked a value less than 262.1, there's an 80% chance of us being picking a value that's, that would make that true. Um, so they're actually writing it in the question here. They they're not asking for the K, they're asking for the 80th percentile. <laughs> so they should have put in um, this and said, write the probability statement, uh, fill, you know, write the probability statement where K represents the score that's that's, and then they could have left K blank as well, you know, and then this blank, and you would have had to put both things in. But um, they didn't, I don't know, so. She has some weird questions. That's all I can tell you. Um, oh, this one I always love. Uh, so this used to read, this did, did, did not. This now reads a certain country. It used to read China. <laughs> so it, I still see it as China. So suppose four-year-olds in China average three hours a day unsupervised. Uh, and that most of the unsupervised children live in rural areas. So I just think it's funny that they, ch they changed it from China to in certain countries, <laughs> in a certain country. You know, like we're not going to say which country it is, but you know, like like they leave other questions alone. But this one they changed from China because people in China were offended. They they, they couldn't sell their book in China, so they had to take that out because it disparaged China. <laughs> so I just think that's funny me um but so children in china are left alone for three hours a day and there was a standard deviation of 1.8 hours uh and we they pick out a specific a single child four-year-old child and they want to find out how much time they spend alone so x is the number of time in hours that a four-year-old spends alone per day because that's what it says per day so this one's wrong because it says per week. This says the number of people that who live in the rural areas. We're just looking at a single child, so that has nothing to do with the question. Um, this says the number of time and hours any child spends alone. So not a specific child, not a specific four-year-old, but any, any child. And then this is the probability that you know the it's the number of children. Uh, four-year-old children who live in the rural areas. Again, it's it's not uh, talking about that. They're talking about how long these four-year-olds are left alone. So it follows the normal distribution with the mean and standard deviation. And then we want to find the probability that a child spends less than one hour a day unsupervised. So they want you to write it as a probability statement. So to do that, when you click in here, you get this weird, you get this box of stuff, box of fun. And so um, you don't need it for this one, but you will need it eventually for some things because you have to write subscripts. Uh, so I'm going to show you where those are. So under functions, it, this is the subscript. So when we get to chapter 8, you're going to need this. And chapters you know, 9, 10, 11, and 12, and 13, you're going to need that. So you'll have to write subscripts of things. So that's where that is. Degrees of freedom has to be written in subscripts, otherwise they mark it wrong. It's very strange. But I can just put in x is less than 1. I don't need the box to do this. But if I did, uh, here's the no, symbols, relationships. I can have my less than and my less than or equal to's. And um, my equal to and no solution. So it has some relationships that are built in. So if I needed the equal sign, It doesn't like the less than or equal to. It has to just be less than. So less than less than one. All right. So uh, that's the probability statement that the probability of p is less than one. Well, what is the probability of finding of that a child spends less than an hour alone? Well, 
again, we're going to put that into our calculator where this is our mean, this is our standard deviation, and this goes from negative infinity up to 1. So second distribution, normal CDF. Negative infinity is already in there for me. 1, uh, 3, and 1.8. And we find that it's you know 0 0.13326, and they want four decimal places, so the 1.33. Again, we look at the graphs. Only one of them shows less than. This shows greater than. This shows between. This shows between. So none of these make any sense to this question. So they're really good at uh, giving you distractors for multiple choice. So. It can't be any of those three, so it has to be whatever's left. What percent of children spend over 10 hours a day? So finally we get greater than, but it's the same process. We go to normal CDF. Our new lower bound is 10. Our upper bound is infinity, so 1, second, E, 99. Mean standard deviation are the same. Paste, enter, and we get this 5.03718 da 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 e to the negative five. Because this is bigger than one, you're going to notice you're going to have an e to the negative value here. But they want this in decimal form. I'm sorry, in percent form. So you're not going to be putting this number in. So remember, we'll turn a decimal into percent. We multiply by 100. And so we get 0 0.00503, which is what we're going to be typing in here, because there's six decimal places. We have to move this thing five decimal places, one, two, three, four, five. So we have four, a zero, four zeros, and a five. But if we multiply by 100, it now turns into this number. So we can now put it in. As, it's now a percent. <sighs> And so here, the last one, we have um, at least 90% uh, of children spend at least how long a day? So at least means what? Greater than or equal to, perfect. Okay, so greater than or equal to, so 90% of the numbers are greater than or equal to what? Well, that means that this is 90% of the numbers are greater than what value? Well, we don't know what that is, but and we can't find it on our calculator. We have to find this thing. So if this is 90%, how much is left? Ten percent. Ten percent. Wait, what? Well, if this is 90% in the red shaded area, then the rest of it's 10%, right? Because it's 100% of the stuff. So, oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll have to use our inverse norm. Norm! The inverse of norm is cliff. You all know that, right? 
You all know who Norman Cliff are? Does anybody know who Norman Cliff are? No. No. Oh, great. Well, Sean, you know, because, you know, you're my age. Norman Cliff. That's Norm. That's Cliff. Have you ever seen this show? Cliff Clavin? Oh, good. Some people have seen this show. Cheers. You don't know where it's based, right? You've been to the bar. Excellent. Does anybody, does anybody know where the bar is? Besides Stephanie? <laughs> Bull and Fish Pub, yep. And it's in Boston. So, if you don't, if you, it used to be a big thing. Like, people would go there all the time, like, to get um, t shirts and sweatshirts and stuff. Ugh. So my son does track, and uh, he they just so apparently they're in. I, I don't know if they're in New York or not. Um, uh, but they the, the the race he usually runs is the 55, and the fastest time was 6.59 when he, and he run he ran it in a 6.23, uh, 25. So he would have been able to win the whole win the the meet today, but he wasn't able to sign up for it. So um, so in your calculator. You're going to have to put the 10% with the mean of 3 and the standard deviation of 1.8. And you paste, and you find out that the amount of hours, okay, would be 0 0.69 hours. I mean, they probably could have turned that into minutes and found out what it was. Uh, so times 60. Uh, the average, you know, 90 percent of those children spend more than spend at least 42 minutes alone, or 41 and a half minutes alone, because 0.69 hours doesn't really mean anything to anybody. And then here, um, same thing. They're looking 70 percent of the time it takes more than, which is the same as this problem here in E. It's just that you're using the different mean and different standard deviation. So there, I mean, I, yeah, so like, and that's it. Ta-da, last problem. So they didn't give you a lot of problems. I mean, I, I don't want to you know, give you more, but I would definitely go through and try all these over again. Uh, uh, Oh, well, the only reason I was doing time 60 was so that I could find out how many minutes that was. Because it was in hours, so it said 0.69 hours. And so I just was curious how many minutes that was. That's all. Because a lot of times you're going to get answers that don't mean anything to anybody. They make no sense in real life. Like, I wouldn't talk about 0.69 hours. I would turn that into minutes. <laughs> you know, like if you said, oh, 3.5 hours or 3.8 hours, you would still say, well, gee, that's really three hours and so many minutes. You would still turn that 0.8 into minutes, like in real life, um, in most things, like because we don't ever talk about parts of hours okay. in decimal it's form. With me most of the night, so it's good. You know, we always talk about it in minutes, like, because it's just one of those things, like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, if I said, you know, 0.721 years, well, I have no idea how long that is. Like, I know it's less than a year, but I don't know, it means nothing. So you would go, well, how many days is that? <laughs> you know, you would try to find something a little more, that would be a little more meaningful to people. So that's in real life. Obviously, this, you know, math books aren't real life. Because you know they they talk about you know children in China being left alone. Um, we all know that they're not left alone. They're busy in the sweatshops. I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so um, you know we we have 
like we just have to make sure that the, like if I was really doing this and testing these things and giving this information, I would put it in some kind of form that would be useful to people. But this isn't about that. It's just about can you find you know how to solve the problem as opposed to what is the answer to the problem. So are there any questions about how to do any of these? OK, so question seven is just like question six. They want to have, they have a mean, they have a standard deviation, and they tell you that 70% of the time it takes more than how many hours. So again, if I was to graph this, it's going to be just like the problem from the uh, from part E of question six, but instead of it being nine, more than 90%, it's um, more than 70%. Yeah, it so we have to find. Right, we have to find uh, the the value that's going to be great. That where is that greater? So this was six. Sigma was three, and seventy percent of the time we take longer than how much? Well, seventy percent is all of this. So that's seventy percent. How much is this part? Thirty, exactly. So that's what we would have to use for our calculator because we can't do the greater than; we can only do the less than. Except, like, like I said, I think some of the like the newest of the TI eighty uh, fours can do. Um, it, when it's doing inverse, it can actually do the other side, and it can do in between. Um, I don't know if that's for sh true, but I believe somebody had one last semester and was able to do that. So I, I'm guessing it's still it's available now, but I don't know which version it is, because um, I don't keep up on the newer ones. So like I said, these things will last forever. Um, so people are still using 25-year-old calculators. Like they, like there was no obsolescence built into this. They, 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 so they had to um, build in functions that people would want so that they would buy new ones because they don't die. Like they will run for, you'll have to replace the batteries, but they will run forever. Um, I, like I said, I handed my son one that I've had for 10 years only because the one I have had for 20 years, um, it's hard to read the numbers because it's clear. And the, so the thing the 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 second and and alpha things have been scraped off on them, so they're just hard to read. So because I know where they are, I still use it. But like he doesn't know where anything is, so he wouldn't be able to find anything. Uh, nice, they're rechargeable, so you don't have to buy new batteries. Sweet, crazy, save the planet. Eh, the planet's not going anywhere. Not for a billion. It, it, we're, we're, it, guess what? We we still have about five billion years before the sun explodes. So you know we can't live here forever. We have to find some place to go. Um, and they were they were they just did research that found that um, recycling plastic actually didn't do anything for the planet. Um, it's actually because we just make more plastic anyway. Um, they they have yet. They, to, they have not reduced the amount of plastic that's being, uh, re even if they recycled all the plastic, it would still be more, there would still be more plastic being built. It, it's crazy, like how much stuff we have that's plastic. And all plastics can be recycled, it just costs more. So when they tell you they can't recycle sevens and threes and all that stuff, it's actually a lie. They just don't want to because it's, it's not cost efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there that is true. We are wasteful people. Um, but plastic is a very good 
packaging source. So it, it's kind of why it's used. Like it, it is good for keeping air out and keeping freshness in. And um, we haven't found anything better than that yet. It's like until we do, we're always going to have plastic. Like your televisions are plastic. Your cell phones are plastic. Your, uh, yeah, plastic. And, and the other thing is that we have that, that we use way too much of is um, uh, corn oil. Uh, uh, qu uh, what is it? Um, corn syrup. Like they put corn syrup on everything to make it shiny. So. Yes, bananas do not need to be wrapped. They they wrap the. I, I understand why they wrap the um the the gripping part in plastic because it makes it more solid and less likely to break apart. But they, there's no reason to wrap a banana up in plastic because it it actually needs the air to ripen. Um, I mean, I guess unless it's already yellow because then it turns brown too quickly. It would save it from being that, but like if it's already at that point, they shouldn't be selling it, you know, like that should become a smoothie or something or give it to the monkeys. Not, not the, hey, hey, we're the monkeys either because like they're, um, they don't want them. All right. So any questions about how chapter seven works? Let me just look quick to see. Um, where? Oh, I did I close my class? I don't even know. I'm in Collaborate, but I don't want to get out of Collaborate. I want to stop, Collaborate, and listen. I don't want to. Well, I can leave, and I'll be right I'm back. I share video. It's still recording, right? Yep. Okay, good. Um, share screen. So I just want to see where we were. Um, so, like I said, uh, the test is due by Monday, and then um, you can see the next test is not due, and we're not going to happen in, for a couple more weeks. So we have Chapter Six and Chapter Seven, and then um, then the test is due the week after. So the test, so we still have a, a like a little while before um, test two happens. 
and then we have two more tests after that. Um, so make sure you get chapter uh, chapter two and three. Make sure you get that test done by Monday. So um, I don't think there's anything else I really needed to tell you guys. Um, Uh, what am I? Oh, here's the times. Wait. Right. Oh, that's the finals. Oh, my God. Those are horrible times. Yeah, he would have like crushed this. <laughs> so he'll probably go back uh, next time. All right. So since there doesn't seem to be any questions, all right. I am going to let you guys um, enjoy the rest of your long weekend. Professor, I wanted to ask you a question. Go right ahead. That's why I'm here. Okay, so just to go back over question six so I can understand because at the end of it, in order to find um, the 90%, you're doing inverse, correct? Right, inverse normal, yes. All right, so when you're doing inverse, yeah. the so, lower bound, which nope. is so, so on 90%. Inverse, so on inverse normal, right, you're going to have the area, okay, which is going to be something between 0 and 1. So here, because they said 90% of the students spend at least how long, that's why we decided it was 10% because we can only find less than because it can only find the area less than a number. It can't find an area more than a number. So we have to find the area less than part. So in this one case, we'd have to do the 1 minus the 0.90. Because they want to know 90% is more than what value, but we don't have, we know that we can only find the less than, so we have to subtract it from one, oh, right. and then we put in the mean and standard deviation. So the mean was uh, three, and the standard deviation was 1.8. Okay. Right? And so that's why it comes up with. So then it gives us the value of that number. Like so. Yeah. The 0 0.69 is would be give us the area that's 10% of the curve. So 10% of the curve is below 0 0.69, and then so therefore 90% of the curve is above 0 0.69. Okay. Thank So when they show you that graph that's above that question and D, the graph, that, that where that gray shaded area that starts at 0.69, right? Um, because that's like below one, and then they go to the left, which is the less than, right? Right, because right. So, the, so the, right, right. The graph I show, I, I drew out um, here where I had. Um, yeah. That's really cute, though. <laughs> so this is ninety percent of the data. If that's 90% of the data is above this number, then 10% is below that number. Oh, yeah. 
and only when you're doing the the opposite, which is only the ninety percent that's inverse now. Right. If they tell us the the percent of a value already, they're they're telling us the area under the curve, so that's when we use the inverse. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. They already did the transmission, but then other things started going wrong. I guess. So that's the thing you have to know is whether are they are they talking about um, the mean and they want to find the area or are they talking about the area and they want to find the value. So you have to look to see which thing are they talking about in those cases, okay? And so area will always be in a percent or less than, you know, between zero and one, whereas if they give you an X value, it could be anything. It could be, you know, like they had the, the baseballs, you know, what percent of the baseballs are more than, hit more than 500 feet? You know, and you could find that number. But if they tell you that 3% of the baseballs are hit above what value, then you would have to find that value. And then you have to find that thing. Or below what value, they'd have to find. Then you're, then you're looking at the value. You're trying to find the X value. So they're either going to have you find the X or the probability. Okay. Okay. Maybe they're giving you right, and so it just depends upon which thing. If they if they've given you the x, you're finding the probability. If they've given you the probability, you're finding the x. So I should correlate x with finding the normal C, um, CDF and probability inverse. Yes. So so I'm gonna okay. hold on. So, so we have one form. We have one formula that we're dealing with. Z equals x minus mu over sigma. And so they're going to give you one of two things. They're going to give you this value. Oh, the, the, the or they're going to give okay. you they're going to give you this value in the form of a percent. So one of those two things is going to happen, and then like, right? So because they give you a percentage, that's easily that that's like I said, it's it comes from the table where the z scores. So you'd find look on the table, find the z score where that probability is. That gives you the z score. Then you have to solve for x. So they're going to give you one of those two things, and you have to find the other one. Basically, is how it works. Okay. Okay. So. If you have the probability, they're going to give you in a, in a, in a probability or a percent. That's they've given you the z-score. You know, they they're either giving you the p of x. So they're going to give you one of these two things. That's some pro, some percent or some probability. So that means they're inadvertently giving you the z. Otherwise, they're giving you the x. And asking you to find the z, which then allows you to find the percent or the probability. Because if they've given you the probability. Why can't you just give me a link to the original? Fine, I'll find a better picture. No, there wasn't a big door there. It was just that storm door that was kind of goofy. So if they give you the probability they've given you this number in here, which then says, okay, I need to find this z-score. So that's so that they, you can then find the z-score from the probability. Then you can solve for x. Otherwise, if they give you x, you turn it into a z-score and then find the probability. So we don't actually deal with the z-score in the calculator. We we skip that step. But in reality, that's what we would what, what what we're doing is we're find we're we're given something either inside the table to find z to then find x. Or we're given x, which then lets us find z, which then lets us find the probability, the, the number inside the table. So that's how it's going. But our calculator skips all those steps, skips the, the the middle step of finding the z-score. It doesn't. It ignores having to do this. 
So it's good in the fact that it takes out a step, but it's bad in the fact that you kind of miss what that step is. Professor, so just to confirm, I'm going to ask you if it correlates to normal CDF. Did you confirm that? Wait, if, if you have what? If the X is given and yes. that's the probability, you're using Correct. normal CDF. Yes, time. we're always right, right, exactly. So if they're giving you the X, if they've given you the X, you're going to use normal CDF. If they've given you the probability, you're going to use inverse normal, yes. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah, there's no way for her to. Okay. Um, left, Mr. Cooper. All right. So, any other questions? No? All right. Then I'm going to let everybody go, and I will see you all next week. Okay. Thanks, Professor. No problem. Just send me an email if you have anything, have any questions, and I will get this uploaded and um, uh, put it into week the week six one.